Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Shouldn't be too hard to find. Just go to Matthew and then back up just really just a couple of pages if you've got a good study Bible, and you'll be right there. Malachi chapter 4. Title of the message is Capturing Your Kids. I want to say it's been a, a great weekend so far. If you weren't there yesterday or last night, you missed a real blessing. It was called Amour, and I was warning people as they were coming into our family life center, you better be careful. It's a very romantic atmosphere that's going on in that gymnasium. They just did a, a tremendous job. It was a fun uh, raiser to help our kids to go to camp this coming uh, summer. And I think we got some really good offerings uh, that went along with that and great food, great uh, atmosphere. We just had a really, really good time. And then to top that off, to just put the icing on the cake, so to speak, uh, Brother Darren, I, he invited me to come into his class. He's a controversial guy, let me tell you. He did a great, great job with that class, and there's some really good things that they were discussing and carrying on. I think uh, what he presented to his class is, what would you do if you had a son or a daughter who came home and said to you one day, I'm going to uh, live with some guy, and we're going to move in together, not marry. How would you handle that? You know, that's reality today, isn't it? A lot of people are facing that. Right here in our own church, many people have faced that kind of a thing. Even worse, somebody comes in and says, Mom, Dad, I want to declare to you I'm coming out of the closet that I'm a homosexual. How would you handle that? What would you do? Would you get rid of the kid? Would you give that authority a tone in your voice and say, Well, you're no longer my son. Get out of the house. You're not welcome back here anymore until you straighten your life out. People that do that, there's other people that will love them no matter what. But this message that I'm going to be bringing to you, even though I'm not going to be bringing things like that up so much other than in this introduction... I want you to know that when you capture your kids' hearts, you may be capturing a lot more than their hearts. You may be capturing what they may fall into in the future if you'll just follow God's design from his word. That's what I'm trying to give to you. I'm, I'm going to read this to you, and let me kind of build it up a little bit with a question mark. And here's the question. The question is a very simple one. What do you need to do to raise a kid to be the kind of kid that you want him to be? Now, I know that can get complicated, and I'm going to be covering that. What would you do? What is the one thing you would say you've got to do? Out of all the many things that are involved in raising someone up from a child on, what is it you would do? What is it you would claim that we need to do? Well, look at it. Here it is. It's in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, I'm going to stop right there in that verse. Let me read it to you again. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, there it is in just one very simple statement, and that statement is that if you want to win your kids, you've got to win their heart. You've got to win the heart of your kid if you're going to win your kid's life. Stop and think about that for just a moment, if you will, because the key to raising the kind of kids that you want is to capture their heart. How do you capture a kid's heart? That's where the real question comes up. There's a lot of consequences I want you to know that go on if you don't capture your child's heart. That kid is going to be exposed to so many things that are out there in the world today, things like Darren's been trying to equip his class to face because they're there. What are you going to do with that? Those aren't far-fetched things. They're very real going on in our world today. People that look at marriage as just being something that you just have a piece of paper that declares that you're in love and, and you don't really need that piece of paper. And we've got a whole lot of people sitting in the pews that are simply saying, we don't know how to handle that. We don't know what to do. Well, I think it's far better to go way on back, if you can, and, and realize what you can do from the very start. Now, I want to read something to you that was kind of alarming to me when I read this years and years ago. It was an Ann Landers poll. I really don't remember how many years ago, but boy, it was a very, very clear poll that really brought up some disturbing things about our country. She says one of the lar largest responses she's ever had in a poll that she's taken concerning parents. And here's the question mark that she asked, the question that she asked them. If you had it to do over again, would you have children? If you had it to do over again, would you have children? Now, what would you say the percentages would be of all parents who have had children and raised them up in this, this poll that she took? How many would you say said, no, I wouldn't have kids anymore? Anybody want to guess at that? Just think in your own mind. Go ahead. I heard somebody. 
70% of the parents, 70% of the parents in this poll said, if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have kids. Well, I want to tell you, that's disturbing. I hope that I've captured your attention because there are some messages that can be preached. All messages should be this way, but some are just a, in a special way. They bring you to a place of realizing, I've really got to hear this message because it's going to really help me. Well, this is one of them. You're going to find that one day the doctor's going to come in and say, it's a boy. I, I guess anymore today, they don't necessarily do that. You know, you know ahead of time. But you're going to look at that little bundle that you're holding in your arms. Do you realize what you're holding in your arms when you do that? A gift from God. And that child is going to give you so many memories in your life that you're just going to, it'll cause you to tear up. Uh, we're, we're at that place now in our life. We look at our grandkids. We look at our kids. And we look at pictures from long ago. And many, many times, Don and I, as we're going through those pictures, it'll cause us to well up. Tears run down our face. Tears of joy that would run down our face. Did you know that that little child that you can hold in your arms that's going to bring so much joy in your life can absolutely break your heart? So much so that it might be like some parents that have talked to me, Brother Staten, I just want to die. I never realized that I could be hurt so deeply by someone that I love so much. One thing we need to understand about love is the capacity of love to hurt you is enormous, enormous, because of what's wrapped up in it. I think I'll start with uh, one very simple thing that's not new at all, but boy, it is so profound. I want you to listen to this. It is a poem, uh, sort of a poem, by Doris Nolte, and it's all about our influence on our kids. It's a good place to start this message. It's entitled, If. Now, because people oftentimes come up to me after a message like this and say, could I get a copy of that? This will all be on the Internet. Get on our, our Internet site, and you get into the messages, my notes, exactly what I'm preaching to you right now will be on the internet probably before you get out of the building. If, if a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy. If a child lives with shame, he learns to feel guilty. If a child lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. If a child lives with security, he learns to have faith. And if a child lives with approval, he learns to like himself. If a child lives with acceptance and friendship, he learns to find love in the world. Now, that's really what this message is all about. I know it might seem complicated to you right now, but if you'll just stop and think about it, I, that's why I put it in one phrase. What's the one thing you've got to do, the one all-important thing you've got to do if you want your kids to turn out the way that they ought to turn out? You've got to capture their heart. It's a lot more than a kid coming up to you and putting his arms around and saying, I love you, Dad. Or I love you, Mom. There's much more that's involved in it than that. And we're going to get into it. There are actually six points to this message. I think you'll find it entertaining. I think you'll also find it very helpful. <clears throat> I originally put this message together years and years ago. I changed things as I re-preach them from time to time. But in Jackson, Tennessee, I was asked to go to a, to a conference there and to preach a message on kids, on raising kids. I didn't have that message at this time. And I, I knew a number of people that were going to be there, mostly preachers that were going to be there. And I knew that many of those preachers that were coming to that conference uh, that so many years ago, that they had had terrible things happen in their home, uh, things that you and I wouldn't be so alarmed at today because we've seen them. We've seen it all. It's all come about. And I remember when I preached this message there that there were so many men that came up to me afterward weeping. Wish I'd heard this message a long time ago. It's a common response. You might be hearing it for the first time. And if you are, I want to challenge you to let God take control of your heart and your mind right now. Will it solve all your problems? No, it's not going to do that, but I can tell you what it will do. It'll set you on the right course. You may have a son just like Darren was bringing out to us in the Sunday school lesson who you're living in the midst of this. You've got a homosexual son. And you want to handle it in a scriptural way. Well, th this will cover that. 
You may be looking in your own home and saying, I've got a daughter, and she's living with some guy, and he's a nice guy, but she knows better than that. How do you handle that? Well, let's get started. The very first thing that I want to bring to your attention, all of my points in this message, six of them, start with a K. That will help you in remembering. Is the knowing. The knowing. You've got to know your kids. You know, that might seem like a strange thing to say to somebody who's a mom and a dad, but if you'll stop and think about it, this is the right place to begin. And I'm going to tell you something that I've learned down through the years. I've discovered there's a lot of parents who don't really know their kids. How do your kids feel about school? How do your kids feel about church? How do your kids feel about certain friends that are in their life? What's the biggest problem that your child's facing right now? What's the tragedy that they've just gone through? There's a lot of things that parents don't know about their kids. I want you to look at Psalm 46, and I'm going to read you verse 10. It'll be also on the screen, but it's one of those powerful verses in the Word of God that even though it's short, it gives to us some really pow a really powerful principle. Here's what it says. Be still. Be calm. And know that I am God. Be still. And know that I am God. Come away from the busyness of life. Come away from the pressures of life. And be quiet. And you will know that I am God. Now if you stop and think about that, that's equally true about kids and parents. God wants us to understand that if you want to know God, you've got to, you've got to be in touch with God more than just on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. If you really want to know God, listen to me, if you really want to know God, it takes time to be with God, a lot of time to be with God, and He will meet with you and speak to you and talk to you and cause lots of things to happen in your life if you'll simply take the time to get to know God. And you, you can't do that unless you're still. You're quiet. Dr. W.A. Criswell, many, many years ago, I, I think back in 1976, 77, I went to School of the Prophets down in Dallas, Texas. At the time, I was in Montana, and I stayed with a judge down there and really got to know this guy and really enjoyed him a great deal. And Dr. Criswell gave me some advice way back then. He said this, The greatest thing that you can do for your ministry is to give your mornings to God. And here's what he meant. You've got to have time alone with God if you want to know God. If you want to hear his voice, if you want to know what's going on, you've got to have time alone with God. He said to me, that might mean that you've got to get out of your house and go in the belfry in the church. Nobody ever goes up there. But it will give you quiet and peace where God can just finally get a hold of your heart and speak to you. Listen to me. I, I haven't gotten off where this message is about. You've got to do this with kids. You can't just look at a kid and raise him in your home and feed him. And do all of the things that need to be done. Bring him to church when he's little. And that's, that's all there is to it. It takes daily time. And a lot of time. There are a lot of parents that will end up doing things that they shouldn't do in terms of time. I don't have a lot of time because I've got a, a lot of responsibility at my job. And so I don't have much time with my kids. But the time that I have is quality time. Can I tell you something that the Bible teaches very clearly? It not only takes quality time, it takes lots of the quality time. There is no substitute for the quantity of time. So I'm thinking about it, if you will, for just a moment. What means more to you in this world than your kids do? Why aren't you spending the time with them that you need to spend with them? I'm going to get into some of that. I want to read something to you from one of my heroes, Dr. James Dobson. He has done more for the home and for the family than I suppose anybody in modern times. And Dr. Dobson, uh, in a book that he wrote, my, what, what My Parents Did Right, I'm going to read you a couple of paragraphs, and I want you to listen to this carefully. This is an enormously successful man. Listen to what he says. I grew up knowing that my folks loved each other and that they loved me. I've known my dad loved me from my earliest moments of awareness, and I've known it in my adult years. I will long remember and be indebted to the words of tough love back in 1969. I was running at an incredible speed, working myself to death just like every other man I knew. Although my activities were bringing me professional advancement and the trappings of financial success, 
my dad was not impressed. He had watched my hectic lifestyle and felt obligated to express his concern. He did so in a lengthy letter which included this following paragraph. And this was this what I'm about to read to you his dad sent to him. And here's what he sent to him. I have observed that the greatest delusion is to suppose that our children will be devout Christians simply because their parents have been or that any of them will enter into the Christian faith in any other way than through their parents' deep travail of prayer and faith. But this prayer demands time. Time that cannot be given if it is all signed and conscripted and laid on the altar of career ambition. Failure for you at this point would make mere success in your occupation a very pale and washed out affair indeed. Dr. Dobson goes on to say, Those words written without accusation or insult hit me like a blow of a hammer. My father reminded me that my number one responsibility is to evangelize my own children just as he did me. Bringing them to church will not get it done. Churches are not substitutes for the home. They can't be. They can enhance what's going on. Great stuff last night. I just was so impressed with Jeremy with the kids that you had there, and you lined them up afterwards, and they were taking so much pride in what they were doing we got a lot of good kids right here, kids that you can be proud of, kids that are making right decisions as time comes on in their life and as they look forward to the future. They're just doing a lot of right things. But I'm telling you as a parent, Dr. Dobson is telling you as a parent that it takes time, and you can't conscript all of your time away and expect you're going to raise your kids the way God intended to. Now, the second point is this. It's one thing to raise your kids and to know your kids it's quite another thing to keep your kids. Did you think about that for just a moment? Keeping your kids. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. This verse clearly teaches us that the way we train our kids to develop patterns in their life that are going to last the rest of their life. Think about that. What you and I are doing with our kids are going to develop patterns in their life that will last the rest of their life. A lot of people will read this verse and say, praise God, I raised them in church, and, and I know that the Bible teaches that they're going to come back to God even though they've gotten away from God. Well, that may be true. That's not what that verse is teaching. That verse is teaching something far more profound. Let me read it to you. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What the verse is teaching is, you're developing patterns in your kid's life that when they become adults, grown, when they have their own home, they're going to carry those principles of characteristics right on into the, their life as an adult. Think about what you're doing right now. You are developing patterns in your kid's life. Take a very simple one. You tell your kids that prayer is very important and we hope that you'll pray all of your life, but they've never seen you pray. You tell your kids the Bible is the word of God and it's worthy to be trusted. It's worthy to look at and to give you guidance throughout your life. But they never see you open your Bible except in church. I can't tell you how important this is. And once again, this all takes time. I'm kind of tying these two together with this next thing that I want to give you. This so impacted my own life many, many years ago. It's a title of a song and I'm going to read you the chorus and a couple of the verses of this song. How many of you remember the name Harry Chapin? Anybody remember that, that guy? Okay, you remember. Charlie, you're dating yourself, buddy. This was a, a neat guy who wrote some uh, really powerful songs, and this one, I think, is the most powerful of all. Can I tell you that right after he wrote the song, I can't remember if it's a matter of months, but I'm pretty sure it was just a matter of months, he died after he wrote this song. And this song was devoted to his child that God had given to him. And it's entitled, The Cat's in the Cradle. Here's what it says. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. But there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it. And as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. And then the chorus goes like this. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. We'll have a good time then. We're going to have a good time then. My child turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball. Come on, let's play. 
can you teach me to throw? And I said, not today. I got a lot to do. And he said, well, that's okay. He walked away, but his smile never dimmed. And he said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, one day I'm going to be like him. My son came from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, what I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I can just find the time. You see, the new job's a hassle and the kids with the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, my son was just like me. He'd grown up just like me. You know what that song is saying? That song is teaching us something very powerful. You're raising your kids with patterns in their life that are going to affect you the rest of your life. And this dad in this song that Harry Chapman wrote, he didn't have time for his kid. He wasn't a bad dad. He was not a bad dad. He just didn't have time with his career and all that was going on with his job. He just didn't have time. And even with that good reason, the son grew up. And because his dad didn't have time for him, he didn't have time for his dad. Because the pattern that his dad had set had been indelibly marked upon his life. And we're doing that with our kids, too. Time's important, but it's not just an, ins it's an instrument that you're going to have to use in one way or another in developing a quality relationship with your family. You know what I'm really talking about here? It's not just the time element. It's the trust factor. It's the trust factor. All quality relationships are built upon trust, and especially in the family. I want to give to you, and I'll do this quickly, eight duties of a father that explain what I'm talking about and what you have to do in raising your kids. Here's duty number one. A father must cultivate a sense of family identity. Duty number two. A father must demonstrate an ongoing love for his wife. Duty number three. A father must understand and respect his child's private world. That's a powerful one. He has a private world, and no matter how powerful you are, no matter how much influence you have over this kid, you can't get into his heart unless he opens it up to you and says, come in. That's why I say you've got to win their heart. Duty number four. A father must keep his promises. Duty number five. A father must give his children the freedom to fail. Duty number six. A father must be the encourager of the family. Duty number seven. A father must routinely embrace his children. And finally, duty number eight. A father, if he's going to build a relationship of trust with his children, must build it on God's word and not on human wisdom. Now I want to give you point number three. I've entitled it Kindness. Kindness. I guess I could do this in the form of a question. Are you kind to your children? I'm not talking about discipline here because you can discipline children and be very kind about it. In a mountain town in North Carolina, there was a sign as you entered the town with large words that said this. We understand that a serious recession is supposed to happen this year, but we've decided not to participate can I tell you, there's some things that parents need to make a decision about, that they're not going to participate in this, and that is being disrespectful and hurtful to their children. That's a, a really powerful thing if you'll stop and think about it for just a minute. I have witnessed many kids being very demeaning to their parents. I hate you. I can't stand you. I wish I had never been born in this house. And then I have witnessed where there are parents that are very hateful to their children. Why can't you just be like little Johnny? He's such a good student in school, and you're such a lousy student. Johnny's really good looking, and what happened to you? You didn't get those genes from us. Putting them down. 
causing a lot of problems that you're going to have to deal with in life sooner or later. Now let me read this to you, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, and here's what it says. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. you know, sometimes we fail to realize that those commands aren't just for people outside of our home. They are especially for people in our home, our children should be treated, treated with dignity and with respect if that's what you want them to treat you with. Maybe I can uh, really drive this home by asking you a question. I've done this a number of times. I want you to stop and think about it. If you treated your friends like you do your kids, would you have any friends? If you treated your children like you do your friends, how would that be? Are you dignified with them? Are you courteous to them? Are you kind to them? Oh, you can be forceful and you can be a very firm father and still be very, very kind to your kids. Now, this next point is my favorite point of all, and I've called it the kidding. I'm talking about humor in the home. And uh, get your laughing cap on because I'm in hopes that I can get you to laugh. I, I uh, probably should ask you that question, too, about your home. Is there laughter in your home? Is there laughter in your home? Or do your kids kind of just walk the line at home? I see kids that are whispering to their parents. I like that. I like what I'm seeing. Laughter ought to be a routine thing that goes on in homes. Listen to this. I feel like my body has gotten totally out of shape. So I've got my doctor's permission to join a fitness club and start exercising. I decided to take an aerobics class for seniors, not, not high school seniors. I bent, I twisted, I gyrated, I jumped up and down, I perspired for an entire hour. And by the time I got my leotards on, the class was over. I don't wear leotards, but I know exactly what that's talking about. <laughs> Listen to this. I love this one. A new supermarket opened near my house. When you approach the milk cases, you hear cows mooing and experience the scent of fresh hay. When you approach the egg case, you hear hens cluck and cackle, and the air is filled with a pleasing aroma of bacon and eggs. The veggie department features the smell of fresh buttered corn. I don't go in the toilet paper aisle anymore. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. Doesn't it feel good to laugh? Did you know that the Bible teaches that laughter is a really good thing to have? Listen to this. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but sorrow of the heart, by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. We're talking about laughter versus sorrow in the home. Well, this is really important. You don't need a neighbor to do You don't need a preacher to do this. You need to evaluate this under the leadership of the Holy Spirit about your own home. You may impress other people when you talk about your devotions at home and how your kids have memorized scripture and you're sitting down and going through all of that and, and letting people be impressed. What about your kids? Would you just stop and think about this just, just for a moment? Is there happiness and laughter in your home? Because that's a real good sign. Proverbs 17 and verse 22 says this, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. See, God wants his children to be happy. And not just right here in church, but he wants us to be happy at home. He wants there to be a lot of laughter that goes on in the home. Maybe you ought to ask your kids, do you have a happy home? Maybe you need to do that because you might be seeing things differently than what they're seeing. I, I want to be gentle about this if I can, and I'm still not finished with some things I want to give you about it, but I've been in a happy home, my home I'm talking about, most of the time, but it's been unhappy too. Lots of reasons can cause unhappiness in a home, but it ought never to be because of a relationship between the people in the home. Kids sure come up with some pretty amazing things, funny things from time to time. 
In fact, all you got to do, and I've got one that I'm going to share with you. I just love this. I used to get a lot of illustrations from him, but I don't get very many anymore. How many of you get on Facebook and read the posts that are on there? You don't want to admit it. Not one hand has gone up. I know better than that. <laughs> well, this is a post that was put on very recently about a little boy right here in our church. His name is Zeke Fain. I think his mother posted this. She said, Zeke has vomited twice in the last three days. No other symptoms, doesn't feel bad. So today I said, Zeke, what's making you throw up, little man? Without missing a beat, he said, I think it's happiness. I'm so full of happiness that I can't hold it all in. Isn't that great? What a compliment. What a compliment. Might have been a joke. He might have just been trying to be funny, but that goes right along with what I'm trying to get you to see here. You know, maybe what you need to do, this sounds bad to some people. We're, we're serious people, we Christians. We're dealing with serious issues. Heaven. Hell. People are going to hell. We're dealing with serious issues in many other ways. But we can't lose our sense of humor. Nothing funny about people going to hell. But God has made us in such a way that you can't stand under that pressure all the time. You've got to have a relief from that. And that's exactly what humor is about. Now we're almost done, so stay with me. Number five is the kissing. I'm going to take this out of Luke chapter 15 and verse 20. You know this passage very well. It says, and he arose and came to his father, prodigal son. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I, I really enjoyed the uh, Sunday school class this morning. Be glad to get back to my own, Sam, but I, he asked me to come in. It was really good, really good. I, I would just say that there needs to be a follow-up. How many people in your class know people that are living together? And why are they doing that? I shared, uh, I think it was on Wednesday night, a, a waitress that uh, me and some others were, were being uh, blessed by her presence, and she told me she was just living with the guy. She said, I'm not married to him, I'm just living with him. No shame. Didn't think anything was wrong with it. Um, I confess it's my tendency to say, you shouldn't do that. What I did say to her was, don't give up on marriage. She said, oh, I'm not giving up on marriage. I said, well, it sounds like you are. You know, marriage is a wonderful thing, and it sounds to me like you've thrown the baby out with a wash. The reason people get married is because it works. In spite of the times that it doesn't, it works if you do it according to the Word of God. We all know the story behind this verse of Scripture that I just read to you, but it's a wonderful, tender scene. One of the things I see very, very clearly in Scripture is that fathers set the tone in the home. I'm not putting women down when I say this, but God expects this. He, he designed you in this way, and He wants you to be affectionate in the home. Not only to the kids, but to your wife. The kids, it's good for them to see that kind of thing. Even though they're going to say, yuck, that's terrible. I can't believe you did that. The mom kissed her right on the yips. That's what one of the kids in our family used to say. But you know what it really says to them? You can be secure. You can be secure. Mommy's not going to leave you and neither's dad. Gosh, I can't tell you how my heart feels at this moment. I know some of you are really suffering. It's why God gave to us, in his word, an escape from something that will not work. He allows divorce. He doesn't want it, but he allows it. And there are times, few times, that God says, yes, you can have a divorce with my blessing." I, I know this can be a tough message for some. Right here. We're not pushing you away. We're not. We accept divorcees in this church, and we love divorcees in this church. I'm not going to have them do it, but people could raise their hand. You'd see there's quite a number of people in here have been divorced. We're not judging them, but we are loving them and trying to bring them to a place where they feel acceptance, something they've been robbed of. Here's the last thing. Don't judge me until you know what this is about. If you really want your kids to turn out the way you want them to turn out, you've got to kill them. 
You may feel like killing them at times, and I'm not being literal when I say that. Just take a listen to this as I read you out of Genesis chapter 22. I have a few verses that I want to read to you. It's our job to train our kids so that they're better equipped to serve him. And this passage that I'm about to read to you, we need to do in order for that to happen. Here's what it says in Genesis 22 and verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Now look what he wants him to do with his son. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you about. Take this kid that I gave to you, a miracle that I gave to you, and kill him. I didn't say murder him. Kill him. Let me go on reading in verse 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have withheld, not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now everybody's going to answer this question the way you're supposed to, I'm sure. Where do you think your kid came from? Where? Just absorb that for a moment and think about it. Where did that kid come from? Don't be like Nicodemus was. What? You've got to be born again. You mean I've got to enter a second time into my mother's womb? Don't think in those terms. He came to the place where he understood what Jesus was saying. That's what I hope that you're going to do too. See, here's the bottom line for you. The bottom line is that you've got to understand that your children are a gift from God. He has, listened to this phrase, he has only lent them to you. And he expects you to raise them in his nurture and his admonition. Now you may be looking and saying, Brother Staten, it, I'm, I'm like those guys that you said, the preachers that came to you and said, we wish you'd known this before. Listen to me, it's never too late. It's never too late. God expects you, listen to me, to sacrifice your kids by giving them back to him. You're going to like what you get in return. I did that with both of our kids, Donna and I. They're, they're, we understand, Lord, they're really yours. And there's a sacrifice to be had. I miss my son every single day of my life. He's four hours from here, but he might as well be 40 hours from here. It's just hard to give up your responsibilities and go see him every day or every week. But I know what he's doing. Thank God for Facebook and Twitter. I'm so glad we have those. I stay up with him that way. They were going on a ski trip, I think. Is that what it was? Or a tubing trip? I'm not sure. One or the other. Our kids are going on next week. Always something going on. He'll call from time to time and say, Dad, it's your terrible son calling you again. And I say, why do you say that? And he says, because I know I don't see you anywhere near as much as what I need to. I said, well, you don't. You don't know the tears I've shed from missing you, putting my arms around you, kissing you on the cheek, telling you that I love you sharing the things that are going on in our church and in our lives. Yeah, I miss that. But you know what takes care of all of that for me now? I know that you're serving God and winning kids to Christ. In heaven, time won't be an issue. In heaven, distance will not be an issue. Let's agree that you and I will take all the time we can we still got an eternity that we're going to spend together. And we'll catch up then. Dad, I just love you. And I love him. I'm ending on that emotional note because I want to strike your heart. What can you do right here in this service today that will change for your life what needs to be changed? 
It may be that God is speaking to you as a son or as a daughter. And you're having some real struggles right now. If your parents are still alive, I want to make a suggestion. It's a truthful one that you can do today. If your mom and dad are close by within a driving distance, go see them today. Tell them the truth. My pastor preached on raising kids. He used some illustrations that spoke to my heart, and I just want to say to you, before you're gone, I really love you. I'm so grateful for how you raised me. And if they're not nearby, isn't it great to have phones? Pick it up. Call them. Just say to them the same thing. I really love you. And I'm so grateful that you raised me in the way that you did. Now, one last thing. All of this is based upon one fundamental fact. You can get overwhelmed with all this. You may say, boy, I'm glad he's got the notes on the Internet because I'm going to take that. I'm going to get to work on this, and I'll check one off once i got it mastered and then check the next point off. I admire what you're trying to do, but it won't work. This is too hard to do. It really is. Simultaneously, it's just too hard to do. But let me tell you what you can do. You can make certain that your heart and your life belong to Jesus Christ. And you'll find the Holy Spirit that lives within you will give you the ability to do all of these things that will put your home on a solid rock. Now, here's what we're going to do in this invitation. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's the starting point. Let me explain what I mean. Maybe you've never come to a place in your life where you've said, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner because I feel the weight of my sin on my shoulders. I feel conviction about sin in my life. That's from God. And you need to accept his son as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're a parent now, it'll make you a better one. If you're going to be one day, the power of the Holy Spirit living within your life can bring you to the place that he needs to bring you to do what he wants you to do. And if you're here today and you're already born again, you know Christ is your Savior, but you'd have to say, Brother Satan, I, I blew it. My kids are gone. I feel really guilty sitting here listening to you. I'm sorry. And that's not my purpose to make you feel bad. But you can do the very same thing. Honey, as you call your daughter or granddaughter, whoever it may be, I love you so much. Would you forgive me? Because I feel really guilty today. That I didn't raise you in the way that I should. That can, that can start the beginning of a brand new relationship. Can it? Let's stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you for meeting with us today. I pray for every mom and every dad, every son and every daughter. Oh, God, give us strong homes. Give us dads that will lead as you commanded we should in your word. Lead lovingly and kindly. Lead, Father, with demonstrating the truths of your word in their own life. Pray for sons and daughters that they'll respect their parents as you commanded us to do. And they'll take advantage of these blessed times that they have now because they're going to be over soon. And I pray you'll give the grace to each and every one that you're speaking to about what they need to do in this service. I know for that one that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, this is the day. This is the next step in their life to bow in your presence and to agree with you that they're a sinner and to receive Jesus Christ into their heart. I pray that that one will come. And those, Father, who know you but have drifted away, may they see that in their home they can start afresh and anew right here today, bending their knee before you, 
getting their own heart right with you so that you can work through that mom or that dad or both of them, making that home fresh and new again, everything you intended it to be. Well, thank you for the Lord Jesus, for the great sacrifice of him upon the cross of Calvary. It's in his name that we pray. Please continue with every head bowed and every eye closed. Jeremy's here in the front to receive you if you need to step out and come. I'm not going to beg you anymore. You know if God has spoken to you and what he's telling you to do. I do want you to leave here free today. Free. If you need to come, please come.